This session, this very important session on current setbacks to nuclear arms control and the implications of that for the Asia-Pacific region. A session hosted by the APLN, the Asia-Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament. This is a network of former senior government officials, prime ministers, defence ministers, foreign ministers and experts that was set up in 2011 with the objective of stimulating and informing debate right around the region on these issues, of coming up with policy proposals and generally working hard to achieve a world which we all want, one in which nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction are contained, diminished and ultimately eliminated. My name's Gareth Evans, I'm from Australia, I was former Australian Foreign Minister and I was the original convener of APLN. I'm delighted as moderator to be joined on the panel today by the two current co-conveners of APLN, Chung In Moon, Chung, uh, Chung In Moon and um, Ramesh Thakur, uh, two members of APLN, uh, Tatsujiro Suzuki from Japan and uh, Xiao Tong from China, plus our specially welcome guest, Lord Des Brown from the United Kingdom, who is the initiator of the European Leadership Network, our counterpart partner organisation. This really is an all-star panel. Moon Chung-in, as you know uh, very well, is special advisor to President Moon Jae-in on foreign affairs and national security. He's a professor at Yonsei University and editor-at-large of Global Asia. Des Brown, next to him, is former Defence Minister of the United Kingdom, as well as being Chair of the European Leadership Network and also Vice Chair of the Nuclear Threat Initiative based in Washington. Ramesh Thakur, our co-convener, is a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and an Emeritus Professor at the Australian National University. Tatsujiro Suzuki is the Vice Director of, the, of RECNA, the uh, organization, the research center for nuclear abolition in Nagasaki, and is a former vice chair of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency. And finally, but by no means least, Xiao Tong is a fellow at the, um, of the nuclear, nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment Tsinghua University Center for Global Policy in Beijing. So let me just frame the debate very, very quickly by saying just this. The outlook at the moment for nuclear arms control is, as we all know, about as bleak as it could possibly be, and very far removed from the environment of optimism that I guess we can all remember 10 years ago when President Obama came to the role in the United States. Since then, we've gone fairly dramatically backward in a number of ways. The only piece of good news, I guess, is that there has been a negotiation at the United Nations of a nuclear weapons prohibition treaty of some two-thirds of the UN membership, but that's generally regarded by the nuclear powers and those who support them and run with them as, um, as simply a project that's empty and incapable of generating results. We have had um, a sense of real pessimism about any positive result uh, from the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference scheduled to take place uh, later this year. We've had the deeply troubling environment between Russia and the United States with the New START uh, Treaty not at all guaranteed for renewal so far as reduction or continued reduction of strategic nuclear weapons are concerned. And then on top of all that, we've had these two very recent setbacks, which are the starting point for our discussion today. The walking away by the United States from the JCPOA, the agreement with Iran, and the walking away from the INF Treaty, Intermediate Range Nuclear Missiles Treaty, by both the United States now and Russia. So against that environment, the problem for us today is to determine whether there are any signs of, for optimism, what are the implications of all of this for the Asia-Pacific region, how we should be reacting 
to it. So let me begin by asking our colleague from the United Kingdom, Des Brown, who as a former UK Defence Minister and initiator of the ELN, on Nuclear Non-Preparation Disarmament, has been intimately involved right from the outset in the debate on the INF and on New START renewal and on the future of the Iran JCPOA. So Des, what, if anything, can be done to rescue these various agreements from the wreckage which, to which they currently seem consigned? So I think before I come to answer this question that doesn't have a very good answer, um, I, I would just like to express my appreciation and thanks to the Jeju Forum for inviting me uh, to this amazing conference yet again. Um, and secondly, to thank the APLN for allowing me to be on this panel, although I'm not the person to ask on this panel what the implications of all of this is for the Asia-Pacific region, other than that these specific problems, and they are serious problems, um, around these three treaties uh, are an indication, I think, of the state of the global non-proliferation disarmament uh, nuclear security regime. Um, they are just, a, a, and, and, and that in turn is a microcosm of a broader um, international problem, which is a, a reduction in respect for an international rules-based order, which comes from both of the extremes, I suppose, of the normal range of politics that we face, and we're certainly facing a lot of this in Europe at the moment, and my country in particular, you know, is being challenged by some of these issues. So I, I think, first of all, and you've already said this, um, you know, it's, it's, it's 11 years since I was the Secretary of State for Defence in the United Kingdom, and the world was a very different place then. It was a a place in which I think all of the people on this platform uh, were optimistic about the future and about our ability to advance disarmament um, and non-proliferation, to improve non-proliferation and to improve nuclear material security because, of course, nobody can have any of these weapons if they don't have the materials that are necessary for them. So we were all very optimistic and I think if we look at what we were doing then, you know, we were, all, we were all working forward on the basis that mutuality of security would be the future and not deterrence, but we're in a different space now. You know, we're in, we're in a world now where there is positively irresponsible rhetoric about nuclear weapons. Um, there's a lack of communication between nuclear armed states. There is worldwide disruption and change. The, rules-based international order is constantly being challenged, sometimes just completely ignored. Um, arms control agreements are not only being challenged, but they are being, uh, uh, they're being derogated from, and in the case of the INF, completely destroyed because there are only two parties to it. But even where an agreement is a multilateralized agreement like the Iran deal or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, then a country that has the power of the dollar can destroy that treaty as well, despite the fact that all of the other parties to it wish to see it continue. Uh, the nuclear non-proliferation regime, regime is under pressure, and we'll probably come later in our discussions to why that is the case and what is the manifestation of that as we approach yet another review of a treaty which has been one of the most successful treaties the world has ever seen, but is, but is significantly challenged. And all of this, in a, in, in a world in which those who think about these things long and hard and have for years say that the risk of use of nuclear weapons uh, as a factor in international relations is a, a likelihood that it hasn't been since the Cold War itself. Um, and, and, and I don't think that's difficult to understand when you look at the degree to which the regime that was developed around that, e even at the depth or height of the Cold War um, has been eroded and, you know, when we lose, as we probably will, the New START Treaty, you know, we'll be in a situation where there are few, if any, 
uh, arms control treaties and certainly nothing of any significance um, on either the strategic or lower level of weapons between the two countries that hold the vast majority of these weapons, Good. many of which are deployed and many of which are minutes from use at any given time. So to that extent, I can see, I mean, I could, I could go over the detail of these treaties and how they got to this place, but we have tried our best in Europe to preserve the JCPOA, and we are the people who will most suffer from the absence of the INF because, you know, these weapons can only hit us from either side of the bilateral countries who are in this treaty, but I fear that we will not be successful in relation to either of them. Just one more word on the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in Iran. There has been some softening slightly of President Trump's rhetoric in recent days, at least yeah. as compared with that of his national security advisor, the egregious uh, Mr. Bolton. Do you see any light at all in that particular area? Uh, manifestly, as you've just said, the European effort to soften the impact of the United States sanctions has not really been very successful because of the fear of the international corporates about uh, the, you know, the dollar pressure that can be exerted on them by the United States. I mean, just, just on that particular one, do you have any sense at all that there's a way out of the mess that we're currently in? Well, I mean, the Europeans set out with China and Russia and Iran to preserve this treaty. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the Iranians overwhelmingly have respected the treaty. Whatever else they may be doing in other aspects of their behaviour, and I'm not excusing any of that, but they have observed the treaty. And even the United States President's advisors told them they were observing the treaty. So they had observed the treaty, and we wanted to see it continue because it is, it's the restraints of that treaty that mean that Iran will not have a nuclear weapon. So we sought to deliver to the Iranian people, who are the key in this, the, the benefits of the sanctions relief that should have gone but 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 nobody's going to trade with iran if they have business with the united states of america and if their secondary sanctions can damage the business more than the trade with iran we substitute and then of course you know sanctions were specifically imposed in relation to oil trading which makes a big difference but but of course you know I, I, I mean, I welcome the words of the President of the United States in Japan when he moves off what is aggressive and warlike conversation or commentary that can only be interpreted as, as wishing regime change. When you look at who his advisors are, and when those advisors quite freely talk about regime change, not only in Iran but elsewhere too, of course I welcome that, but... But I can't guarantee that that will be his position tomorrow or, or that it will have any significant difference to the way in which the sanctions, the extraterritorial sanctions that the United States can impose because of the power of the dollar uh, will be imposed. But in any event, you know, businesses will look at Iran and say, this is just not worth the trouble. Okay. You know, whether we can beat this or not, whether the special vehicle that the, the EU has created works or not, and it hasn't even started working, it is just not worth the trouble if we can do business elsewhere that doesn't attract that. Thanks, Des. The reason I emphasise Iran in particular is a prelude to asking Chung In Moon a question. You're the most directly involved of all our panellists on the issue of greatest immediate interest to this audience and indeed the whole world at the moment, that on the Korean Peninsula. What do you see as the implications of the INF developments and JCPOA in particular for the denuclearization peace process here on the Korean Peninsula? The Iran exercise in particular does seem to raise obvious questions about the trustworthiness of the United States as a partner in negotiations. As someone as close as you are to the negotiations here, has this been a relevant factor, do you think, in the present dynamics on the Korean Peninsula? You raised in a ban treaty, JCPOA, and INF. There are three commonalities underlying those three international, you know, kind of regime. First is the, it is the United States which has been the primary driving force 
of derailment of those three agreements. Second, uh, there is a danger of demolition of rule-based international order. Third, as a result of that, there has been very serious credibility of the American commitment. The think those three are the very, very important one. And look at the Ban Treaty. Okay, you said the two thirds of you know United Nations members supported the Ban Treaty, then who opposed the United States? And all the allies of the United States allies of the United States, they opposed South Korea. We champions denuclearization of the of North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. We has gone with the United States, Japan, even your country, Australia. All American allies, some in NATO member, all NATO members, they have been supported with, you know, they go, they went against the Ban Treaty. Therefore, you know, JCPOA, is a, President Trump just overnight <coughs> scrapped it, okay? INF, again, after, you know, kind of, you know, long, you know, consideration, deliberation, the United States just scrapped it. Therefore, you know, United States, has become rule-breaking country and undermining the very credibility of international regime, okay? Therefore, I think we should keep that in mind. And the United States has been so far benign hegemonic leader. Now there is increasing concern about the role of the United States as a you know, benign hegemonic stabilizer or leader, okay? Number one. Number two, what are the implications to the Korean Peninsula? When Secretary Pompeo met the Chairman Kim Jong-un July last year, in fact, uh, it is known that uh, Secretary Pompeo asked the question that uh, would uh, in a breakdown of JCPOA uh, affect North Korean you know, policy? And it is known that uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un said, no, it is irrelevant. But now I think it is becoming extremely relevant. Why? Because the Trump administration is using two tools. One, increasing sanctions against North Korea. Second, a la John Bolton, the possibility of regime change, changing Islamic Republic in Iran. And even though Chairman Kim Jong-un said, okay, it is irrelevant, and Iran is far away from North Korea, Obviously, North Korean leader will be worrying about the you know, consequences of the Iran deal. Okay, therefore, you know, Chairman Kim Jong Un is concerned about the sanctions of the United States or the U.S.-led international sanctions. Uh, North Korean leader is concerned about the regime stability, and obviously, if JCPOA really goes wrong then it will have a very profound implication on North Korea. More than that, recently Iranian foreign minister visited Pyongyang. Okay, that means what? You know, there could be further cooperation between Tehran and Pyongyang, and that can complicate the entire situation. We are worried about you know, that kinds of consequences. On INF, we are worried, you know, we are really concerned, because the reason why the U.S. scrapped the INF deal is not simply because of Russian you know, unruly behavior, but also because of China factor, okay? China is not, part, is not party to INF, therefore China has been increasing its uh, you know, arsenal of you know, ballistic missile capability, therefore it is one way of countering China, okay? And the end result was, you know, the scrapping of INF. Then our concern is this. If there is no international regime to regulate proliferation of you know, intermediate or long range, long range in the ballistic missiles, then its consequences would be you know, ungovernable arms race in our part of the world. We are very much concerned about the arms race consequences of the in a cancellation of the INF. Therefore, we have a multiple implications from those you know, developments. 
Which is a perfect segue to you, Xiao Tong. Uh, China's position on arms control issues is obviously going to be critically important with your status as P5 member, the only nuclear weapon state in the region, apart from Russia, of course. What's your take on these recent developments, or what's your understanding of China's position on them? And more specifically, after you've responded to that, what do you think will be China's reaction to the suggestion that we are seeing from President Trump, or from his administration, that if arms control, nuclear arms control negotiations can ever get started again between the United States and Russia, the US would want that to be a broader framework embracing China as well. Initial indications from Beijing is there's not much enthusiasm for that, but what's your take and your understanding of the different positions on this? Sure. Um, I think I will give very pessimistic uh, assessments across the board on those different issues. Um, on Iran and the JCPOA, I think China has a clear interest in uh, preserving the treaty, but given the current U.S.-China trade war and U.S.-China bilateral problems, I doubt how much China wants to stand up uh, on behalf of Iran against American pressure and therefore to keep its uh, trading relationship with, with Iran and help Iran uh, keep benefiting uh, from the deal. Um, so um, I don't think China can do much to help preserve the treaty. And more importantly, as China-US bilateral rivalry grows, I think there is a growing thinking within China that, okay, the current American attention is all on China, is to counter China, preventing Chinese rise, and therefore, if American attention can be diverted away from China in other regions in the world, that might be a benefit uh, for China. So from that line of thinking, I think China, at least some strategists within China might feel comfortable sitting on, on, on their hands and watching the situation develop uh, over Iran. Um, on the issue of the INF Treaty, the Chinese understanding of what happened um, is very cynical to some extent. The mainstream perception in China is basically the United States used, used some technical pretext to withdraw from the treaty. So it's a political decision. There's a strong strategic interest in the United States to withdraw. And a very important part of that strategic interest is about China, is the American concern about Chinese military capabilities. And in order for the United States to uh, find countries, partners in this region to deploy future medium-range land-based missiles, the Chinese thinking is the United States would have to stir up regional tensions to exaggerate the China threat, uh, to make other countries in this region fear about China's rise. And that's how the United States can persuade its allies into uh, agreeing to deploy American uh, medium-range missiles in the future on their territory. So that, I think, leads China to um, develop an even more a pessimistic understanding about American intentions in this region. And against this background, um, there is this very high level of confidence among the Chinese experts community about China's long-term potential to grow its economy and to outcompete the United States, even in an open-ended competition over missiles you know, uh, and, and other strategic military technologies. So that further decreases Chinese interest in joining in any type of multilateral INF regime in the future. And certainly, um, 
about the broader issue of Chinese participation in nuclear arms control, the overwhelming thinking in China that you can often hear is that, well, China is not against nuclear arms control, but in order for China to be treated fairly and equally in any future arms control negotiation, China basically has to acquire similar capabilities, military capabilities with other negotiating partners. So the belief in power, poli power, politics, uh, power politics is very strong. I think for that reason, it's very hard for one to convince China to play a very proactive role at this moment in arms control in general. We know that both Russia and the United States have something like 7,000 nuclear weapons each. It's generally believed that China has only of the order of 300. Are you really saying that China is going to build another 6,700 nuclear weapons to match the other two before it's going to be interested in nuclear arms control? Is that what you're saying? Is that what your reading of the situation domestically is? That's pretty alarming, if so. Not exactly. Uh, I don't <laughs> think China has any intention to dramatically build up its nuclear arsenal. But China feels, um, you know, the um, development by the United States of advanced non-nuclear military technologies, including missile defense, conventional precision strike weapons, uh, etc., can very much help um, neutralize China's small nuclear deterrent. Okay. So uh, if, if those developments, those non-nuclear developments continue to grow, China would have to uh, grad, uh, greatly strengthen its nuclear uh, forces. So it wants to hedge against the future uncertainty. And the China, from the Chinese perspective, China made that mistake before. Uh, during the Cold War, China once claimed openly that it would start working with US and Soviet Union to cut nuclear arsenals if the two big powers reduce their arsenals by half. I think that's the figure that China proposed. But, but after US and Soviet Union indeed uh, reached that level, China felt its nuclear arsenal is still too vulnerable. Um, and so those uh, previous lessons even um, worked more against uh, China, current Chinese interest in, in arms control. Thank you. Uh, Tatsu, from a Japanese perspective, Tell me your reactions to what you've just heard from Chung In and from uh, Tong Zhao about the implications of these setbacks for the region. Do you think they will have a serious negative impact or only a marginal impact in what is already a very messy situation in Northeast Asia? Thank you. Um, I tend to agree with all these uh, uh, speakers that the situation is very serious. I think the impact will be uh, uh, very uh, serious on Northeast Asia also. And on the other hand, uh, Japanese government is expressing uh, modest concern so far, both on the uh, JCPO and INF Treaty. And it means that Japan is facing, I mean, Japan's so-called nuclear dilemma uh, is deepening. <coughs> and that's the uh, current, uh, my observation. Uh, let's go a little bit one by one. The JCPOA, um, my concern is, of course, that uh, as, as everybody said, that the United States is the only one who breaks this agreement, and Iran is very upset. And uh, the recent uh, NPT uh, review PREPCOM, uh, Iranian ambassador actually threatened, uh, not specifically threatened, but uh, they, he, uh, he emphasized the right to withdraw from, from NPT. And this is a serious co concern to me. If, if the situation gets worse and worse, Iranian may consider withdrawal from NPT. Um, but it's a good sign that now Japanese government, Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe, wants to talk to Iranian government. That, that may be a good sign that Japanese government is, is seriously thinking about this uh, uh, situation. For the INF Treaty, uh, Japanese government also expressed a modest concern. And the interesting is, I think, in, uh, uh, not in October last year, but just uh, February, the government statement did mention about China. In October statement, they did not mention China. So there is an increasing concern about the Chinese uh, military threats in the region. 
For burn treaty, uh, Japanese position is very clear that Japan uh, supports uh, the United States nuclear weapon states position that this treaty will not reduce the number of nuclear weapons, but the public, overwhelming the majority of the public support the Ban Treaty. So this is a big gap between the Japanese public and the government. And uh, uh, this, after this particular uh, the Ban Treaty uh, was signed, um, the Japanese so-called nuclear dilemma, I think it's much more evident the pressure on the government is I increasing. So I think the Ban Treaty has uh, some uh, marginal impact, some impact on, on the umbrella states and the nuclear weapon states to explain to the public why need, we need nuclear weapons, why nuclear deterrence is working or maybe not working in these days. So I think it's a uh, situation maybe <coughs> slightly changing in, in, within Japan that uh, the government may have to think about this nuclear dilemma again. Ramesh Takua, you're the multilateralist in this group, former UN official. Where, if at all, does the United Nations come into this picture? We've heard about the Ban Treaty a couple of times now. Is that Ban Treaty, which was, of course, negotiated through the UN, just an empty exercise in virtue signalling, or does it have some potential positive impact. Do you see the JCPOA and the INF setbacks as in fact validating the criticism that's been made by the nuclear armed states and those who ride with them um, that this is just an empty useless exercise and that arms control if it's going to be pursued at all has got to be done in another way. What's your take as a multilateralist on this? Thanks Gareth. Uh, listening to all this gloom and doom and pessimism uh, I'm tempted to say that the United Nations is a place where all lost causes go to be revived or at least put on life support till the atmosphere changes. Uh, I think from a UN perspective, there's a fourfold response. First, the INF Treaty was critical proof of the fact that both sides were acting, not just talking, uh, responsibly as nuclear powers. Uh, by the same token, the fact that they walked away from it is evidence of the decline of that sense of responsibility for preserving the nuclear peace. Uh, second, and following from that, of course it is a historical fact that unilateral measures and bilateral agreements have reduced global nuclear stockpiles by between 80 to 85 uh, percent from the peak at the height of the Cold War. But now it seems evident that further progress in nuclear arms control and disarmament will need to move, move beyond just these two powers because we have moved away, the world has moved away from nuclear dyadic relationships to interlinked nuclear chains. And we've already discussed uh, the China factor in the INF uh, context. Uh, to this end, multilateral negotiations and agreements will be required, ideally culminating in a universal and fully verifiable nuclear weapons convention. And of course, for all its faults, the fact remains that the United Nations is the core of the global multilateral order with unmatched international legitimacy and unique convening power. Third, we've heard already how the JCPOA showed the way for resolution of regional non-proliferation challenges through a multilaterally negotiated, UN-endorsed, and independently verified international agreement. When we look at the complexity of the challenges confronting us with regard to North Korea, after the fact, it seems to me a great understated achievement of the JCPOA was that it succeeded in achieving disarmament before the fact, before Iran crossed the threshold. And the fact that the United States can walk away from that points to another enduring pathology of the UN system, and that is how do you hold the P5 themselves to international oversight and accountability when they break agreements. That is something we haven't managed to find an answer to, but I think is relevant. Uh, and fourth and finally, coming to the Ban Treaty, far from discrediting it, I think the INF and JCPO developments validate the assumptions behind the Ban Treaty and its process and vision. Uh, assumptions in the sense that, as Des explained very well, I think, uh, and as you began, Gareth, Nuclear risks are spreading, multiplying, and intensifying. But meanwhile, the mantra of the step-by-step -step approach 
uh, by the nuclear powers, uh, has not produced any credible pathway to a world free of nuclear weapons. Uh, process and vision in the sense that the international community acting as the United Nations is as big a stakeholder in the nuclear peace as those that have the weapons. And as such, the ban treaty shows that the international community is prepared to take ownership of the process and provide shock therapy to revive the stalled nuclear arms control agenda. <coughs> There's plenty of themes there we can pick up in the general discussion, but let me in a second round of questions seek from you some very quick responses on another issue associated with this, and that's the implications of these setbacks we're talking about for moves towards more nuclearization uh, in the region, more proliferation from states that presently do not have nuclear weapons. And I want to begin by asking uh, Chung In Moon and uh, Tatsu Suzuki and Ramesh Takur, each of you from countries who are United States allies, uh, Australia, Japan, South Korea respectively, how you see the mood developing in each of your countries in response to this environment where there is diminishing confidence in the possibility of nuclear arms control and a particular environment where the United States is visibly treating its allies as encumbrances rather than assets. In this environment, we are beginning to see some signs of people saying we've got to have nuclear weapons of our own in this new uh, circumstance. Uh, what's your understanding, beginning with you, Chung Yun, of just how serious that uh, sentiment is in South Korea? You know, compared with, you know, even Japan might have the same kind of concern, but you know, whenever North Korea undertake, undertook uh, nuclear testing, the public opinion in South Korea strongly support the possession of nuclear weapons. They think that uh, uh, we are all, you know, we all understand that uh, we are under the American extended deterrence. Therefore, U.S. is providing us with a nuclear <coughs> umbrella, but uh, some. Uh, you know, former politician Chung Mong Jun used to argue that the American nuclear umbrella is a broken umbrella. Therefore, we should have our own nuclear weapons. And some people argue that if our own uh, development and possession of nuclear weapon is not feasible, then uh, let us put the pressure on the U.S. so that U.S. can retransport tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea. For example, you know, the Joseon Ilbo is the most influential daily newspaper in South Korea. In each editorial, you know, the Joseon Ilbo used to defend the possession of independent, possession and development of independent nuclear weapons. Therefore, you know, particularly, you know, conservative right-wing people in South Korea tend to strongly support uh, nuclear, you know, weapons. Therefore, for example, when North Korea took the nuclear testing the sixth nuclear testing on September 3rd last year, almost 60%, more than 60% of South Koreans in a support of in a acquisition of independent nuclear weapons. And therefore, really worrisome development. Of course, uh, the Korean public do not know about uh, all kinds of internal and external in the barriers to the possession of nuclear weapons. You now, we can be subject to the international sanctions like today's Iran and North Korea, Okay, and you know, the possession of nuclear weapons will have a, a profound negative impact on ROKUS alliance. Some, you know, uh, advocates of non-proliferation in Washington even will threaten to sever alliance tie with South Korea, and our economy can be, you know, really deranged as a result of our effort to acquire nuclear weapons, and South Korea's peaceful use of atomic energy will be totally you know, destroyed by our attempt. But uh, we Korean people are not aware of that kinds of negative consequences. They are much relying on nationalist peers that uh, we should have nuclear weapons, we should create a nuclear deterrence against North Korea. That is really worrisome. As, you know, Tachu maybe will be talking about, whenever we have that kinds of, you know, move in South Korea, then <laughs> right-wing <laughs> Japanese argued, why not us? We should have nuclear weapons. Therefore, in a current development, you know, really is likely to trigger nuclear domino in Northeast Asia. That's really worrisome. South Korea is really worrisome. 
So, Tatsu, say a little bit more about both government and public sentiment on this issue. Right. Um, so-called credibility of nuclear, U.S. nuclear umbrella is declining. There are two meanings. One is actually people believe in nuclear deterrence, but don't, don't, but don't believe the United States anymore. <laughs> Those people won't have nuclear weapons by themselves. But uh, uh, the other par part of the, uh, the belief is that nuclear deterrence itself may no longer be uh, effective. Then we should pursue our alternative security policy. Those are the people uh, who we are working with together right now. <laughs> and that's what we need to move forward. And uh, by the way, but, uh, uh, for the conservative people, as Moon Jae-in suggested, this is the time for Japan to rethink nuclear option, but not necessarily having a nuclear option by, by ourselves, but it, coming back to the 2.5 nuclear principle, bringing back nuclear weapons in Japan. And that could be uh, seriously considered by some conservatives. But uh, uh, the majority of the public don't support. Uh, they believe the military pressure, even on uh, current military pressure on North Korea, or maybe in Iran, those, those pressure will lead to the war, which the public doesn't <coughs> want. So I think the, the declining of the U.S. credibility has a two separate meaning. And I hope that the majority of public will support the diminishing of nuclear deterrence lead to the new security thinking. Uh, by the way, South Korean government made an official announcement that uh, it does not seek any nuclear weapons. President Moon Jae-in, in his speech at the National Assembly in November 2017, he made it very clear that we abide by the uh, you know, declaration on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula of 1992. Therefore, our government position is very clear. The public mood is somewhat different. Well, that's, that's the President Moon administration, but how confident are you about the longevity of that position? Tough question. Ramesh, uh, Australia. Australia having nuclear weapons? <laughs> I think, well, I certainly did not believe that I would see in my lifetime any discussion in Australia, any revived discussion of an independent nuclear deterrent. But we have seen that. Uh, the motivations are threefold. One, the changing balance of power in the Pacific uh, and, and the growing uh, Chinese militarization of the region and the fact that it's coming geographically closer to Australia has undoubtedly raised discomfort and unease in the Australian strategic community. Second, the changing US-China balance has raised questions about US ability to come to the defense of Australia under all imaginable contingencies. And third, the transactional approach of the Trump administration has raised questions about the American will and desire to come to the defense of an ally, including Australia. So those are the motivations. But that said, I think two important qualifications, particularly compared to Korea, South Korea, and Japan. Firstly, there's been absolutely zero interest in any governing circles or any major political party in Australia on this part. The issue has been raised by once influential, but now fringe elements, ex-senior defense officials. Second, even there, the argument is not that we should consider getting the bomb now, but that we can no longer foreclose it forever. And if in the future we want to get it, we won't be able to get it then, and therefore we need to prepare and pre-position Australia so that should we change our mind, we might get it. So I don't think we should exaggerate the seriousness and gravity of this in Australia. But uh, can I just yeah, raise sure. one question to Garrett and you know, Ramesh? How Australia, how can Australia can perceive China as an actual military threat? <laughs> you know, China is becoming like the Japanese in, during the Second World War, or what? I can't. Well, Tom I don't Tom think Zhao, anybody... You know, really, <laughs> does China have any plan to invade no, Australia? Look. Look, very, very quickly, I mean, I can just say, nobody perceives China as having any such intent, but we sure as hell perceive China as having that capability. And of course, always defence planning takes place, not unreasonably, on the basis of capability. And the reality is, for maritime defence of a huge Australian coastline, uh, there's much more talk now about more self-reliance and much less reliance on the United States to do the job for us. Nobody seriously anticipates a war any time soon. I mean, it would be crazy for China to initiate one. And everybody, I think, acknowledges that. But we're in such a volatile and difficult environment. So 
Tong, I mean, to you on this, and then I'll come the, back to you, Des. Two finger by. Oh, was it two finger from Des? Okay, jump in now, Des. So, so, okay. so I, I, I just want to come into this from a European perspective. Well, because I was going to ask you that anyway. So yeah, well, no, but, but I mean, we enjoy ex or some um, non nuclear weapon states in Europe. All of those who are in NATO, uh, you know, have extended deterrence from the United States. And, and we have this constant question that we ask ourselves is, you know, will the United States be prepared to give Chicago up for Hamburg, you know, which is the classic choice. But, but this, is because <coughs> this is because extended deterrence is a very complicated proposition in any event. And it involves a really significant bit of mental gymnastics to see whether or not it deters. But despite that, since the 1950s, in, in a very diverse range of regions, countries, politics, with US allies, it has apparently worked or it has survived. And whether, you know, the people of South Korea or some people in, in, uh, in, in Japan or some people in Germany are in a different space in this, it seems to me to be a constant. But what is different now, I think, and this is the point I think we should think about in this discussion as we go forward, it's not the extended part of deterrence that's in doubt. It's deterrence that's in doubt. It's, people are losing confidence in deterrence for, for exactly the reasons that Tong Zhao highlighted when he shared with us the Chinese view of the implications of the US modernization of its weapon systems. Because ironically, if you look at the at the, at the NPR in 2018 of the United States and its plan to diversify its range of weapons and to deploy them in the 2020s, some of these new weapon systems, which will be uh, remarkably effective, we can guarantee. The reason for that, that was given by the United States, was exactly the mirror image of the explanation that we were given of China's view. It was publicly given in the document and expanded in the press releases that came beyond it. You know, we're in, a, in an environment in which a 20th century weapon system is meeting a 21st century technological environment and it, the deterrence of it is constantly being challenged. And that's the issue in my view. It's not whether or not there will be this extended deterrence because the United States to the extent that it can be counted upon to do this in 2018, recommitted itself in print in the NPR to what we would call extended deterrence. It specifically says it will do it. And no matter what Trump says, in my view, that's where we will be going forward, right? With exactly the same position we've been in since the 1950s, most of us. What will change is that we have this conjunction of modern technology and a weapon system and the implications of these two things coming together about command and control of the weapon system and about other weapon systems that are fearsome and usable and much more usable than nuclear weapon systems. That's the issue of bit deterrence in my view and what we should all be discussing. And in my view, it makes the argument compelling that we should talk to each other about this wherever we sit in terms of allies or competitors. We should talk to each other about this because some of these weapon systems will proliferate significantly because they're inexpensive. Thanks, Des. All points very well taken. And they, we can explore that further in the discussion. But, uh, Tong, just further before we conclude this little round, to the extent that there is a discernible growing sentiment in favour of new nuclear weapons acquisition in the region from countries that don't have them, to the extent there is that sentiment, however small, what can China do to defuse that? Can China take, um, you mentioned a little bit of this before, can China really take a leadership role of the kind that it traditionally has in the region? It's always supported minimal nuclear deterrence. It's always supported no first use. But I, you know, is, is, is China really able or willing or want to play a leadership role in minimizing this concern? So there are, as mentioned, there are two sources of, or two motivations of nuclear pro, uh, proliferation in, in this region. One is nuclear DPRK, one the other is the emergence of China as a military power. For nuclear DPRK, um, 
I'm afraid um, China won't be able to contribute a lot into uh, achieving uh, this goal. Even though China and other countries share the same goal of denuclearization of DPRK, we have to understand that the Chinese interests and American interests in this region, especially over the Korean Peninsula, are becoming increasingly competitive. Uh, both countries increasingly look at regional issues from very narrow geopolitical perspective, wanting to uh, advance their uh, respective influence first and foremost, rather than how they can cooperate with the other big power in resolving DPRK's nuclear program. So that's one major reason I don't think the two big powers would be able to cooperate as deeply as required to resolve the DPRK issue, a nuclear issue. Second is the emergence of China, the reemergence of China as a as a military power. Um, there is a big perception gap uh, we are dealing with here. On the Chinese side, China genuinely believes that it is already making a big contribution to non-proliferation by sticking to a very uh, moderate nuclear capability and posture. However. The fact is, even if the Chinese are purely driven by a defensive objective to secure a small second strike capability, the practical security implication for that can be much deeper and broader. One example is the Chinese development of its uh, sea-based nuclear weapons as a further guarantee of its second strike capability. So the goal is purely defensive, simply to um, strengthen its, its uh, second strike capability. However, because the submarines are not very quiet, they are not very survivable if deployed in open ocean, so China has to deploy them for the near-term future in so-called bastions near Chinese coast, and also use massive conventional forces to protect the submarine bastions. So that requires China to basically transform its naval posture from sea denial to sea control. So a very limited goal to secure nuclear deterrent trans translates into a much, a, a much more aggressive conventional military posture. Another example is China is really concerned about missile defense and how that affects its nuclear deterrence. And therefore, China really pushed back very harshly against missile defense deployment in this region, including against the THAAD system in South Korea a couple of years ago. Another demonstration that an effort driven by a limited defensive goal could have much broader spill over impact to regional uh, security and stability. So the perception gap is China has not fully recognized how its own behavior are really generating threat perceptions in other countries and uh, contributing to their interest in nuclear weapons. So we, have, we need to have an honest conversation among Chinese ourselves, but the situation domestically is making that conversation less likely to happen. We are increasingly, you know, the liberal voices are getting harder and harder to make uh, their voices heard but it's very easy for nationalistic and conservative voices to spread their view. So we are fighting also an uphill battle domestically on this issue. So the urgent need is to break these two conversations in silos, one Chinese conversation and one international conversation. We need to have both communities open up to each other and fully understand each other's threat perception. Ramesh, you want to respond quickly yeah, to something uh, you said earlier on. Tom. Well, I think Des put his finger on what is a key factor in this whole de debate, and that is belief in deterrence. By definition, all the umbrella states for decades have believed in and have internalized deterrence provided to them by someone else. And in a situation where the strategic environment is felt to be deteriorating, and the reliability of the U.S. guarantee 
is under question, thinking of an independent deterrence is a logical next step. So that's a general thing. Specifically in response to Chung In about Australia, you know, feeling paranoid about our security is our very distinguished history in Australia's case. I think the Hawke Keating government and Gareth Evans as foreign minister in particular were the atypical government in identifying uh, the need to engage with Asia so that we have cooperative security with Asia instead of security from Asia. Uh, and as a result, I think the regional security environment and Australian security was considerably improved during that period. But in Australian foreign policy, I'm afraid that remains a golden era that's gone. Well, <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it too. But um, The last round of questions, I do want to allow a full half hour for discussion with the audience. The last round, I want to address this specific question of nuclear risk reduction in the present environment. We, particularly, as Des Brown has said, the new concern about cyber, sabotage, espionage and so on, has put new anxiety about command and control systems and additional layers of vulnerability to an already very fragile system that's out there. So what can we do to, to reduce the risks? Um, there's two sort of basic schools of thought about this. One of the absolutists, you know, nuclear ban treaty people saying, what matters is global zero, no compromises, just get there, set the normative standard and try and persuade the world's publics to get on board. The other kind of approach, which has been that which is adopted by the APLN, the Asia Pacific Leadership Network, which we all belong to, the other approach has been to say, look, we just have to be realistic and we're only going to get there by a step-by-step -step approach even if so far we've had very little buy-in to such steps from the nuclear armed states. But we talk, <laughs> about, we talk about the doctrinal step of no first use, buy-in by everyone. We talk about reducing deployments of weapons. We talk about de-alerting, de-alerting and re taking, reducing the risk of, of, of early you know, trigger, trigger responses to situations. And we talk about a fourth D, you know, decreasing the numbers of nuclear weapons. Uh, is it still realistic to talk about those steps in the kind of environment we're seeing with JCPOA, INF, New Start, and all the question marks? But what is the way forward to try to reduce the risks which are supremely obviously out there at the moment? Chung In, do you want to start on that? But I think the first most important is a really macrostructural issue. If the United States really wanted to stick to the alliance and strengthen the alliance, under the, that kind of security structure, you know, rivalry with China and Russia will be inevitable, and there is no way for us to reduce you know, nuclear risk. That's really, really structural factor. That's the most important, and that, that then pre prescribes us to look into really new security architecture in the area. Second thing, what I have in mind is about the, we. In, it might be difficult for us to come up with the Asia-Pacific approach to nuclear risk reduction. We need to disaggregate Asia-Pacific in different regions. For example, Northeast Asia, as a, you know, Dutch and his, you know, Nagasaki group has been working very hard. Maybe we can think about the nuclear weapons free zone on the Korean Peninsula in Northeast Asia. Then nuclear haves and nuclear have nots, they can sit together and they can talk about the whole this issue of no first use. De-escalation, de-alerting, and all these kinds of issues, okay? And so that, and also nuclear haves can assure all the issue, not only no first use, but the negative security assurance and positive security assurance. Those kinds of things are very, very important one. Another important point is this, you know, uh, we need to really make a civil society's engagement, people's awareness of risks and dangers of nuclear weapons is very, very essential. If, even in China, I think the you know, Chinese citizens can talk, talk about negative consequences of nuclear prolif proliferation for some strange reason. Okay, Japan has been the victim of nuclear weapons, other than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, very few people could talk about the, you know, the dangers of nuclear weapons and etc. Okay, in Korea, virtually <laughs> we don't have any public discourses and debate 
on the dangers of you know, nuclear weapons. Therefore, we really need to mobilize civil society, NGOs, in spreading knowledge of dangerous nuclear weapons and come up with some kinds of joint works. And therefore, I would say that the three-step approach seems to be very, very essential. Des, you're a step-by-step -step man in a Euro-Atlantic context. If so, with what likely result? So, I mean, I am, <clears throat> I am committed to a step-by-step -step approach to this because my experience in you know, public policy terms is that if you want this sort of change, that's the only way in which you can do it. Um, but that having been said, I mean, I think we are, for a number of reasons, many of which are beyond our control now, uh, reaching a moment of crisis in international terms. So, so I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to the Ban Treaty, um, but I regret that the process that brought it about did not stay in the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons argument for longer because it was that that was activating young people, it was that that was bringing to the attention of people um, that, that, that are, are generating with people more broadly the sort of response that Chung In has, is hoping that, that, that um, people more widely would have because the dreadful consequences of the use of one of these modern weapons, you know, was beginning to be quantified and better data and better science, you know, was showing what the consequence of it would be. And interestingly, it was in climate change that its consequences were going to be the most damaging. And that leads me to my second point. You know, we are, as a world, going to be pressed immediately by resource constraints in finding a response to what is probably now inevitable, which is serious climate change, and a dramatic effect in the way in which we, you know, can occupy substantial parts of this planet. So, you know, we're going to have to redirect resources if we are going to give it the response that is necessary, away from this increasing desire to spend more money on, uh, on, on, on security and defence, to defend ourselves from man-made weapon systems that other people have, and for them to defend themselves from man-made weapon systems that we have, you know, which seems to me to be against the threat of climate change, um, a ridiculous use of, uh, of, of, of the money. And, and the, the, pro the problem, as I perceive it with the Ban Treaty, is that it has narrowed the focus of the debate Internationally, you know, we're about to go into a review conference for the NPT, which we must preserve. And the division there are between those who are for the treaty and those who are against the treaty. And it honestly reminds me of a 1980s debate in the United Kingdom about nuclear weapons, which was, were you a multilateralist or are you a unilateralist? Right. And I just say this in a passing. The next time you meet somebody who says they're a multilateralist, Ask them what they did this year to advance the agenda of multilateral disarmament, and you will be astonished at how few of them are able to point to even one thing. I mean, we have a multilateralist on this panel in the form of Ramesh, who spends his whole life trying to advance multilateral disarmament, so he's excused from this criticism, but the vast majority of them can tell you nothing. So, you know, we, we need to, in my view, find a, a new dialogue, and I believe it will be found in this conjunction of science and technology and weapons. You know, I mean, if you want to genuinely have sleepless nights, then search the web for the US Department of Defense, Defense Science Board reports, and read them. But read them, <laughs> ensure that you have a sleeping pill thereafter because you won't sleep for a long time after you've read them. The United States are completely open about this. They have already lost control of the command and control of the resilient weapon systems. You know, and I have spoken to the people who wrote those reports, and they tell me that protecting the systems from cyber or artificial intelligence or machine-learned attacks upon them in the future will cost more than they intend to invest in the weapon systems to develop them in the future. We are, and we are, we are making sure 
that all of the young people in this room and the next generation have this problem by the decisions that we are making now, by relying for our strategic security on these weapon systems. They do not coexist with modern technology. And as, the sooner we get to learn that, the better, and that will drive disarmament. Because if you can't control the weapons, you, don't, you can't have them. Ramesh? Fairly quickly, if we can, yeah, because sure. I do want to allow some time. Uh, first, I think the ban treaty, through its stigmatization and prohibition, has had primarily a normative, not operational impact. And that was the intent all along. Uh, I would like that strengthened. Let's remember it was in the context of the INF signing that Reagan and Gorbachev made their famous statement that a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must not be fought. I would like the General Assembly to reaffirm that. Because one of the problems in the present environment is the growing normalization of the discourse of nuclear weapon use. I think such a statement would be very useful and be hard to oppose by anyone. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you said, Gareth, I think there's very little alternative to the 4Ds step-by-step -step approach. The problem with the nuclear power step-by-step -step approach is it's very difficult to see any visible steps in the forward movement at all in the past few years, and what steps we have had have been going backwards. I think the four Ds between them will reduce the risks while providing concrete evidence of the intent to disarm at some future date, and therefore will revive hope and confidence in the process again. By the four Ds, you're referring to doctrine, reduced deployments, de-alerting, and decreased numbers, the four Ds. Yeah, Suzy, touch yes, um at the NPT review prep conference, at the NPT prep conference, uh, I heard that, that uh, uh, the nuclear weapon states continue to say that the nuclear weapon is necessary for security. And that concept itself must be challenged. Otherwise, you cannot eliminate nuclear weapons and you cannot <laughs> eliminate nuclear risk. And in order to do that, Japan particularly also emphasize again the humanitarian consequence of nuclear weapon use. What if nuclear weapon would be used, even one weapon is used, what's gonna happen? And everybody knows that the nuclear weapon should not be fought. No winners exist in nuclear war. So those concepts itself should be challenged. And uh, uh, in a sense, nuclear deterrence theory must be challenged. And that's uh, the basic concern. That's my basic argument. And Xiao Tong. I think we shouldn't be too ambitious in setting our goals. Uh, I think uh, more importantly, we need to focus on damage control because there is a real risk of intensifying uh, nuclear arms competition among the big powers in this region, uh, driven by genuinely uh, different, genuine uh, disagreements about the impact of non-nuclear technologies. So. Uh, substantive and candid discussions on those issues are uh, required to stabilize the existing nuclear relationships among the big powers. That's one. And similarly, um, I think modern military technologies are also causing the phenomenon uh, called entanglement of nuclear and conventional military capabilities, which is a recipe for rapid uh, escalation of a conventional conflict to the nuclear level and greater awareness of those risks is also need uh, to be built. And lastly, I think there is a real need to reduce the risks, uh, the nuclear risks from North Korea's nuclear arsenal. As long as North Korea possesses its nuclear uh, capability, uh, we really need, the international community really need to educate the North Korean leaders on the limits of nuclear weapons uh, or the risks of uh, destabilizing nuclear postures, such as pre-delegating nuclear launch authority to lower level military officers or putting their nuclear weapons on high alert uh, in peacetime, etc., or the risk of um, um, you know, uh, uh, other uh, uh, military practices uh, that are not aware yet to the North Korean leader. Okay.
we've had many, many issues raised for discussion. I'm sure we could keep going for a long time, but please, from the audience now. Yes, and we do have a microphone, do we? Sorry, right down the front. Who's got, is there a roving mic? If not, perhaps just shout. If you could stand up. And, Okay, there's one on its way. And could, you, and could you please introduce yourself very briefly? Well, um, thank you. My name is Jakob Hallgren. I'm the Swedish ambassador to, to South Korea, and I used to work for six years, actually, at CIPRI as the deputy director. So I have followed this discussion with a lot of interest, and I recognize many of the discussions that I've followed very closely during my time at, at CIPRI. So a couple of reflections and some, some quick uh, questions. Uh, uh, I like this concept of, of challenging the very concept of deterrence, and I'd like to add a little bit to what Des Brown said about technology, because uh, what hasn't been discussed so much here or only in passing is the impact of the new technologies. We're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, but the pace, I'm thinking about the new hypersonic glide, and I'm wondering, is deterrence really working in a scenario where the actual flight time is so quick that in order to wake up a president and to open that suitcase and actually to take a decision whether you are seriously re retaliating or not, I mean, we are in a new world already, maybe now, and, and what does that make to, to deterrence? And then just briefly, uh, you mentioned the review conference of NPT uh, next year and the relation to, to the ban treaty. What's your, and maybe to the whole of the panel, what's your assessment? Uh, are we headed for a breakdown at, 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 uh, at next year's review conference? Uh, uh, because uh, the, the ban treaty, I mean, that's, that's, a, uh, that's the voice of all the peoples out there. The frustration of that Article 6 hasn't really worked at all. On the other hand, the ban treaty has been criticized for, is it in duplication with the NPT? Uh, does it actually weaken the NPT? And where's the verification in the ban treaty? Do you see that there is an opening for a renegotiation or maybe a development of the, of the ban treaty is, is maybe my last question. So thanks. I was sorry to through no, so no. many issues. But well, you, well, it's your fault because you put up so many interesting questions. Well, Thank you. Question. I mean, first of all, on hypersonic weapons and the science. Um, Tatsu, do you want to, you're the scientist in our midst, <laughs> do you want to comment on this? Okay. Um, I'm not a uh, scientist on AI or uh, new technologies, but I'm working on, right now, actually currently working on this issue. And there are two sides of the issues. Of course, advanced technology can improve the defense capability of all kinds of weapons. And it is true that uh, uh, AI, for instance, can reduce the human failure. So there are arguments to promote those technologies. But on the other hand, as you said, uh, the pace of the development is so fast. And the, the, the issue here is, is not just technology itself, but the, the transparency of the development between those libraries. If you are not if you do not know what other countries is developing, then the scarce, the threats may increase. So my, my concern is basically not necessarily technology itself, but the transparency and the dialogue, lack of dialogue in developing those technologies. Ramesh, do you want to comment on the NPT and the ban treaty connection? Uh, I think on the technological side also, the overall impact is to blur long established boundaries between conventional nuclear space cyber domains and that makes the architecture issue much more difficult to handle uh, on that uh, on the ban versus npt as you said yourself the ban treaty would not have developed sufficient momentum without the accumulating frustrations over the glacial pace of progress in Article 6 commitments. And the contradiction in arguing that we don't have any legal obligation to disarm under Article 6, but there is no legal gap to be closed, I think was a very important driver of that. I think it has been a mistake to try and insult and demonize ban treaty supporters. The fact is, every single country that voted for the ban treaty is a member in good standing as a non-nuclear weapon state of the NPT. 
in their mind, this was an effort to complete the NPT's agenda, not to undermine it. And I think it's a mistake to try and attack them instead of saying, okay, these are your concerns, let's sit down and let's meet them, and we promise to do better. Chugin. We have been delinquent. Chugin, on that subject. In fact, APLN, APLN has been trying to bridge the gap between MPT and ban treaty. It was a futile effort. No, it's extremely difficult. We even organized one conference in Seoul two years ago, you know, bridging the gap between MPT and a you know, ban treaty. It was ex ex extremely difficult. Maybe Des you know, would conquer with me. <laughs> but Des, you don't think the ban treaty in any way undermines the NPT, do you? No. I, well, you've I, already said you don't. But. Well, no, I, I mean, I don't believe that. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the, I mean, the, the NPT is an extraordinarily successful treaty. Um, and and, and the, the real heroes of the NPT are the non-nuclear weapon states. Because the predictions at the time of the entry into force of the NPT were that there would be 35, approximately fewer of them than there actually are. And they have not develop nuclear weapons. They, and, and, you know, the whole of Latin and South America go to bed at night and surprisingly wake up alive in the morning without any extended deterrence or nuclear weapons. Now, I mean, it's a mystery to all of us, of course, how they manage to do that, as does all of Africa, because we need them. You know, we cannot sleep. In the United Kingdom, we cannot sleep or rest in our beds at night unless we know that we have a submarine out there with nuclear weapons on board, extent, you know, pr providing deterrence 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, I mean, for most of the people who live in the United Kingdom, that's a nonsense. But, but that's what we do. Um, because the weapons dictate the policy. If you have them, there are things you have to do. You know, and... And currently, we, there are no countries in the world who do not have nuclear weapons who are aspiring to have them. Now, that's the first time in my lifetime, this episode, that I've been able to say that. And that's because of the, the non-nuclear weapon state's behavior. Um, and, 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 because, and, and that's why I think that the NPT will survive, not well, but it will survive this next review because the non-nuclear weapon states value it um, and they will, they will make, sure, make sure it goes forward. I, I mean, the, the, the other point, though, I think that I think needs to be made, you know, is that we are already in an arms race by the nuclear armed states. You know, this... Um, this mirroring of motivation that we now see between China and the United States, between Russia and the United States about the development of these new weapon systems that are capable of using nuclear weapons to war fight, um, you know, is, is an arms race. And they are all justifying this as nuclear weapon states by the behavior of other nuclear weapon states, but in the P5 environment and in the NPT environment, blaming all the rest of the world for the instability of the world that causes them to have to continue to have nuclear weapons. Now, somehow, the vast majority of the people in the world need to, who don't want this need to get their voices heard. You know, and the way I think, and I'll repeat something I said before with strength, is to show them what they already know but will not admit, which is that they cannot guarantee the security of these weapons in the technical world that they themselves are responsible for developing. The reason the United States knows the insecurity of the command and control of its weapon systems is because it is building a capacity to do that to other countries' weapon systems, and they are doing the same to it. So they have to talk to, the, talk to each other about this. Let's just make two very quick points also from an APLN point of view. The reality is that three of the four possessor states in Asia are not party to the NPT at the moment. So we have to deal with that reality one way or the other uh, thing. Second, 
for the first time in human history in February, one nuclear armed state carried out a missile strike inside the territory of another nuclear armed state, and that's India in Pakistan. And for the first time in human history, one nuclear armed state and a second nuclear armed state, their air forces fought aerial dogfights. So these are worrying times from a nation point of view. Okay, more questions or comment from the audience, please. Yes, from the front row. Microphone. Oh, my Microphone right. down the front here, please. <laughs> oh, uh, my name is Kosuke Takashi. Um, I'm a Tokyo correspondent of the James Defense Weekly. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Tong. Uh, in Japan, nowadays, nuclear deterrence is weakening. That's what we think. Because the, just a few days ago, Trump said the North Korean missile early this month, that's not a threat. That's ordinary thing. But uh, Abe said, that violates the UN sanction, etc. So US and Japan now uh, concepts are decoupling. And then many Japanese think uh, Trump put Washington uh, before the uh, Chicago, uh, to yeah, to Tokyo. They put uh, much more priority on Washington rather than Tokyo and Seoul. So, but you said, you think, do you think the uh, nuclear deterrence in Asia by the U.S. is strengthening, enhancing? You, uh, you said uh, U.S. is planning to put the more medium-range nuclear missile, etc. So, you think the nuclear deterrence is actually uh, beef, 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 being beefed up in your point of view? Or we think that's weakening, but you think strength, being strengthening. Okay. Tom? I, uh, you know, I, I certainly understand Japanese and... and, and <laughs> well, I certainly understand that from the Japanese and South Korean perspective, the political commitment from the United States uh, behind the nuclear extent deterrent is, is weakening. Um, uh, but from the Chinese view, the, the U.S. is strengthening its deterrent with uh, non-nuclear technologies, missile defense, uh, and other conventional military platforms, in addition to the possible deployment of medium-range land-based missiles in this region. Those missiles won't necessarily be nuclear armed, but even if they are conventionally armed, they could cause uh, desperate reactions from China because they are short range, they can, you know, their flight time is short, so their counterforce potential is even greater. Um, so even conventionally armed medium range missiles to be deployed in this region can very much destabilize uh, the nuclear relationship uh, between US and China. Can I, can I just as to hold the North Korean you know, the missile launching, you know, there's a big debate whether it's a you know, ballistic missile or not. In fact, our Ministry of National Defense has not yet determined whether it, it was in a ballistic missile or not, because our Ministry of National Defense traced the trajectory of the missile flight, but it went like a, in a ballistic missile, but it came down, and then fly horizontally. If it is a ballistic missile, it is impossible to make that kind of flight trajectory. Therefore, now, you know, really, our you know, defense analyst, you know, now you know, encountered a major you know, dilemma here. Should it be defined as a cruise missile or is it a ballistic missile? It's, if it is a scandal of a Russian model, it's a ballistic missile. But the flight pattern is very different. And also, as you know, uh, President Trump you know, pointed out, uh, it. It did not exceed the national boundary. Therefore, you know, he was saying that it's a small weapon. I don't care. Therefore, there is a kind of internal debate. And also, there's a close you know, coordination between American intelligence in the community and South Korean intelligence community, how to understand the missile and how to define it. Time for one last question, if anyone's bursting. Over yes, right the, at the back. back there. Right at the back corner. Just one question and quick answers, please. Hi, thank you so much for picking me for a question. My name is Jay Wuhan. I'm a rising sophomore at Northeastern University studying international relations and political science. 
And in regarding one of the few things I just learned in classes, actually, I had a question about the difference between uh, lateral nuclear proliferation and horizontal nuclear proliferation in the South Asian, South Pacific, Asian Pacific region and the world as a whole. Um, it seems that, relating back to the previous question, we just had a conversation about how technology influences the weapons that we observe today. Um, regarding that, with the lateral proliferation of nuclear weapons, I just had a question that maybe because of technology evolving on a daily basis and t the evolution of technology being inevitable, is lateral nuclear proliferation um, inevitable? But equally, it seems that in the Asian Pacific region, due to the politics, uh, horizontal nuclear proliferation seems inevitable as well. So my question would be, which form of proliferation seems to be more viable to be addressed with modern day solutions? And if it is addressed, if it's viable, and if it's enough. Thank you. Small question to finish with. Anyone want to tackle it? Ramesh? Well, I think uh, what you said is correct, but the choice you present is a false one. I don't think it's a choice between tackling one and ignoring the other. We have to address it all. Uh, any perception that those who have the weapons uh, modernizing, making it more sophisticated, changing the doctrines to use, uh, developing low yield, variable yield, going in for hypersonic, etc. That has an impact on others because it demonstrates the continuing utility of nuclear weapons. And the longer you have them and the more you define them, the more it becomes attractive as a weapon of option to others as well. Conversely, the more it spreads to others, the more those who already have them will invest more heavily into developing theirs. So it's a it's a mutually reinforcing relationship that has to be cut. Des, you want to say something? So, so I mean, <clears throat> despite the fact that I have trouble with the vocabulary, but then again, I never really studied this. I just lived with responsibility for nuclear weapons. I agree entirely with Ramesh. The, 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 the existing danger is that people, I used this phrase early on, talking irresponsibly about nuclear weapons. And they are. You know, the current generation of leaders speak about nuclear weapons in a way in which previous generations particularly agreed among themselves that they wouldn't for very good reasons. But now we have an open debate about whether you can restore deterrence even after a nuclear weapon is used. You know, there are people writing extensively on this, talking about using nuclear weapons to de-escalate um, and, and developing the ability to, to have nuclear weapons that you can dial down or dial up, that you can use specifically, you know, to bring conflict, including nuclear conflict, to an end and to, as I heard once, the commander of an SSBN say to me, to restore deterrence. Right. I, I told him that if I was still the Secretary of State for Defence, he would not be the commander of an SSBN. But so, so this danger is a present danger. It is a present danger. And it is a reasonable interpretation of what nuclear armed states are planning to do to believe that they are developing nuclear weapons that they think they can use for broadly what is called war fighting. Now that, that's a whole new discussion. That's not about deterrence at all. You know, that is about winning wars and restoring a degree of control that we always believed we would have lost once we used a nuclear weapon. That's far more dangerous in my view that, than anything else. Well, this has been a very rich and wide-ranging discussion, which is impossible to try to summarise now, except I'd say I've got three takeaways, personally, on some of the key issues we addressed. First of all, on the implications for this region of the recent setbacks, the starkest thing that came through to me was about the impact of the JCPOA, the walking away from the Iran nuclear agreement by the United States. In terms of this region, that's probably going to have more effect than anything else in destroying the belief in the trustworthiness of the United States commitment to a serious nuclear arms control. I think we heard that very clearly from Chung In. Certainly something has been on my mind, all of our minds, and I hope that lesson is somehow learned. The second uh, takeaway I think I had was that 
Perhaps it's not yet an occasion for despair about the implications in the global environment leading to more sentiment towards new nuclear weapons development in the region. We've heard that there's some sentiment about it, but its minority sentiment hasn't yet caught fire. However, clearly the best way of keeping any such sentiment under control and ensuring that it's countermanded is for a more effective response to these issues by the United States and China in particular. And I think what we've heard, and very articulately from, uh, from Xiao Tong in particular, is that we've got plenty to worry about in terms of an insufficient attention to that reality by our big guys in the region, China and the, the US. Russia, I think, is beyond the pale at the moment, but it's China and the US that are crucial. And the third thing I think I, I take away from this on the question of nuclear risk reduction, there is some clear sentiment in favour of the rationality of a step-by-step -step approach focusing on doctrinal no-first-use agreement and de-alerting and reduced deployments and so on. But if we're going to get any practical movement towards that out of those who really matter, policymakers in these countries are going to have to get frightened. They're going to have to get frightened about what can go wrong with nuclear weapons. They're going to have to understand the points that have been made so articulately on this panel by Des and others about the impact of the new science, the new technology. We're in a whole new dimension of risk about what can go wrong uh, with these weapons. So I think the immediate task is not to, uh, not to sort of offer kind blandishments to our policymakers. We've got to frighten them into a realisation that um, they can't just go plodding on with this statutory reliance on deterrence that doesn't make any sense anymore in this new environment. I'd like you to join with me in thanking our APLN uh, panel uh, for the contributions to a very important debate. Thank you all. No New Year's Day.